what's out there and how do we learn about it? And we maybe have had the fantasy of, well, you could be an astronaut, but increasingly, you know, there's rovers, there's small satellites, there's all kinds of ways of increasing sensing. Uh, we did a few years ago an issue of Make on space, and some of the fellows that were there were working at NASA at the time. We talked about some projects they were doing. They've gone on to form Planet Labs and create a pretty big size company doing small sets. So uh, Mason Peck is our next speaker talking about making space, democratizing exploration and science with DIY satellites. Mason was at NASA, um, has spoken at Maker Faire before, but now he's associate professor at, uh, in mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering at Cornell. Mason? Thank you. Exciting time! It gave me the opportunity to see some things that people rarely get to see. No aliens, uh, I, I promise you. Um, but now that I'm at uh, at Cornell, I'm reminded, uh, in many ways, uh, what a hard job this is to be a professor, but also in many ways how easy it is. And uh, with my boss here, I'm not going to say I'm overpaid for what I do. Uh, Lance, just you know, don't worry about it. But um, I, I do want to do want to tell you a little bit about why that's the case. Why it's easy to teach people aerospace. Um, and the story has to do with making. In particular, you know, when students come to me, and often when they come to Cornell interested in engineering, they're, they're fairly starry-eyed to begin with. And some of the most enthusiastic students are the ones who are interested in space. Uh, I, uh, it's hard to, to beat it out of them. We, we try sometimes. Um, but uh, when we fail to be successful at that, what we do is we produce some really uh, high caliber students uh, that have gone on to make significant contributions to the field of aerospace, and particularly spacecraft engineering. Our graduates over the last uh, five or 10 years have uh, taken jobs at SpaceX, one of the uh, more visible aerospace startups in the last decade, building rockets now. You just heard about Planet Labs. Uh, Planet Labs, a really exciting uh, company, building small satellites that'll do Earth observation and maybe even be able to take pictures of some spot on the Earth every hour or so, which has extraordinary scientific value and commercial value as well. Uh, and our students are helping uh, make those companies successful. What I want to talk about is um, the other reason why this is an easy job, and that's that although I pretend to teach these students things, they teach me at least as much, and uh, that does make my job kind of easy. This picture here shows a number of people who are at a space shuttle launch. Uh, sadly, we can no longer see that happen, but it won't be long before commercial launch vehicles are supplying the space station on a routine basis. They've already begun doing that. Uh, SpaceX and Orbital Sciences and a couple of other companies are going to be sending commercial rockets to the International Space Station. Uh, and one reason that that's exciting in the context of making is it represents uh, a, a movement that's afoot in NASA, it's also true across the nation, of moving away from the exclusively government-sponsored space activities to uh, a broader base of who can go to space. And I think we're getting close to the time when anybody could go to space. The reason these people wanted to see the space shuttle launch is just for those few minutes, they were willing to spend hundreds of dollars to go to Florida, sit in the sweltering heat, and watch a few, a few seconds worth of a launch. They wanted to be part of that. They wanted to feel intimately connected to that, uh, that space activity. Now what we're able to do with our students at Cornell and what's being done at actually hundreds of other universities around the world is bringing that promise of space home to people on an individual basis. Because today, you have the prospect of doing what, until recently, was only the uh, province of NASA and, for example, the Jet Propulsion Lab. What about the tree? It's about two years ago. You yeah, probably remember where you were base. in August when the Mars Exploration Rover, yeah, sorry, the uh, Mars Science the Lab mission landed. As we go in here. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 Earth G's. Yeah. Two is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Feet shield se has separated, but we found the ground. Expand. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers per second. Standing by for batch shell separation. We are in powered flight. Well, 
We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky green. Sky green is started. Single dive, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. Receive one fire. <laughs> So these are some of the people who had the good fortune to be at JPL when this happened. In fact, a couple of Cornell students were there. If you know Rob Zimmerman and Aaron Stohura, they were in the Mission Control Center at that point. Um, but you know, it seems still to many of us to be a really elite group that has the, the privilege to participate in something like that. Uh, here's how the JPL fo folks look at it, though. Um, this picture here shows the tracks. Uh, if you look on the right, you can see the sort of treads for that uh, Mars Science Lab rover. Um, it built into the treads is Morse code. As those wheels travel over the surface of Mars, they spell out in Morse code the letters J, P, L. Uh, so JPL is, is tagging the surface of Mars with their gang sign, <laughs> and, uh, which I think is fine. And it actually, it actually speaks to this, this impulse I'm trying to get at. What I'm saying here is that the people from JPL, as much as they are you know, kind of in an insider crowd in, in many respects, uh, they also feel this personal connection to space. And they want to express that personal connection by writing their name all over the planet here. They've actually uh, expressed something that I think a lot of us also want to express. We want to feel what it's like to be in space. So I think we can all be in space, and making is part of that. In fact, it didn't even start in the last uh, five or ten years. It started way back. There's something called Operation Moonwatch. Anybody ever participate in this thing? Does this sound familiar? Every now and then, yeah, a few hands go up, right? This is way back, right, just around this time of Sputnik. So late 50s, early 60s, uh, the U.S. government was training people into, tra training people to see what satellites look like. So they'd set up this sort of a, a tent here, maybe at a state fair or at a local university or something. People would line up, you'd go into this dark room, and you'd see a little dot traveling at a certain speed across your field of vision. It's that dot that a lot of us now know really well. Uh, it's the speed of a satellite as it travels overhead uh, in a 90-minute orbit or so. Uh, and when I, was, uh, when I was a kid, when I was in high school, you would maybe see one of these an hour or so. Now it's pretty easy to see one every minute or two. If you go out around dusk or dawn, probably the, the former is the right choice for you, right? Uh, you go out around dusk and you can see light shining off of satellites as they pass overhead, north to south maybe, or east to west. Um, Operation Moonwatch brought home this idea that individual citizens of the U.S. could contribute to something bigger than themselves. They could be the people who spotted a satellite for the first time. So that video won't work. Um, the bigger picture that I wanted to offer is uh, not just about per a personal connection to space and sort of the, the thrill and the fun of it, but also what we can contribute. Just like in Operation Moonwatch, uh, the idea there being that we could contribute to the US's ability to spot other satellites that may do us harm or something, um, there's another problem out there, and that's the problem of asteroids. Uh, they're a problem if you're uh, interested in the future of the Earth. They're an interesting scientific object of study if you're a scientist, and maybe, maybe both if you're a scientist. Why it's a problem is that even though we know uh, a number of these large asteroids, we know where they are, we know that they're not going to hit the Earth. In fact, we don't know where at least 50% of those asteroids are that could, in fact, damage the entire continent, destroy cities. Uh, there's a lot of them out there, a lot of unknown asteroids. We know where most of those huge ones are, the, the, the type that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. We don't know most of the very small ones. Um, you, you might think that this is a, a small deal. Uh, it's actually quite a big deal. Um, if we go forward, okay, again, the slide not working. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Why it's a big deal is that there's so many of these things out there uh, that NASA, despite its budget, cannot detect all of them. Uh, what you see here is a picture of all the, uh, the known asteroids, and there's quite a few that we know. Uh, as time goes on in this animation, uh, you'll see what happens if we add in the ones that we don't know about, and it pretty much fills up the screen. 
So, you know, NASA, having worked there, I can tell you, even though many people think NASA gets a lot of money from the government, and I suppose it does, it's about a half, of the, a half a percent of the federal budget. Um, it's a half a penny on your tax dollar, roughly. Uh, my, my opinion is it's a good deal. But for that little money, I think NASA does quite a bit. But NASA is also not quite in control of its destiny. You appreciate that Congress decides what NASA spends that money on for the large, uh, to a large extent. If we take a look at this problem, the asteroid problem, it is something like... Uh, 1% of 1% of 1% of the budget. It's not a whole lot of money put toward this. And that's science, everything else, all told. When we add in those uh, asteroids that we don't know about, that is, you know, statistically, here's kind of where they would look, it, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a noticeable number. That's where we all come in. NASA has created something called the Asteroid Grand Challenge. It's a challenge to all of us to find all asteroid threats to human populations and know what to do about them. I'm offering this as an example in this educational context because this is the kind of idea that can really catalyze young people. It's not just about building um, a, a device that uh, represents some sort of personal accomplishment. But in fact, if you could build a satellite to go discover the location of these asteroids, or use a telescope to find them, or maybe knowing the track of existing satellites, if you could characterize them by looking at their spin rates, by looking how quickly they flash in your field of view, you can contribute not only to your own education, not only to scientific discovery, but also to uh, saving the world. And I think that's a good goal. So uh, this is one of the many ways in which we can motivate people in the educational environment. I have to say it used to kind of bug me that uh, we would uh, tease kids with the possibility that someday they could be an astronaut or someday they could build something awesome like the space shuttle. These days, it's kind of true. These days, um, thanks to making, thanks to the rise of a number of different technologies I'll talk about in a second, it is possible to put your ideas into space. And your ideas could help save the world. So here's one way in which you can do that. These are called CubeSats. Yes, they're cube-shaped, but more to the point, it's a 10 centimeter, 10 liter volume, a one kilogram mass of electronics that does all the functions you would want of a spacecraft. It can communicate to the Earth, um, and you can build them for not too much money. For the cost of an expensive car, probably, you could build one of these things. Now, launching them is another story. That can be expensive. Fortunately, NASA has come to our rescue and is actually offering free launches for CubeSats if it's part of a university. You apply to the so-called CubeSat Launch Initiative Program, and if you're accepted, you get to launch your satellite for free. They say there's no such thing as a free launch. Well, apparently, apparently, apparently there is. So, yeah, thank you. Um, I got the same enthusiastic response to my joke about the metric system the last time I gave a talk here, so I appreciate that. So uh, citizen space is part of this story. Another part of the story is commercial electronics. These days, smartphones and other commercial electronics have inside them components that are just as good and probably better in terms of reliability and everything else than what you could get for a spacecraft. So we can actually build these off-the-shelf component-based uh, spacecraft. We can build spacecraft from pieces you can find at Radio Shack or buy from uh, uh, magazines like SparkFun uh, websites. You can build your own spacecraft and it'll function in space without having to go through the hassle, let's say, of flight qualifying your hardware or worrying about radiation. Yes, you should worry about that if your goal is to send something to Jupiter, but for these kinds of, uh, let's say, individual explorers, you can in fact build them yourself. In fact, this thing called PhoneSat is based exactly on that. This PhoneSat idea, built by NASA, some folks at NASA Ames, uh, uses as its flight computer a smartphone. If you think about it, a smartphone has everything you probably want to fly in space, right? It's got a, a gyroscope, magnetometer. It's got GPS capability. It's got a computer, obviously. It has communications. It's pretty much everything a satellite has. Um, a few tweaks are necessary, but some of us are actually working on that problem. We're working on this problem of what could we do with off-the-shelf electronics. So on the right here is a picture of a 3U CubeSat, that is three CubeSats worth of volume stacked together, size of the loaf of bread, roughly. We built one of these things last year. We launched it in April, and on board were 104 little tiny satellites. Those things coming out of the 3U CubeSat, they're about the size of a cracker or so. So from a loaf of bread, you thought that was small, now down to a cracker. We've built these uh, little satellites called Sprites. Uh, our students built them. Uh, and they are capable of communications to Earth. They can do some sensing another, and a few other things in space. What's particularly important, though, is they cost about 30 bucks. So, in fact, you can get into space for on the order of tens of dollars. 
And I think that's what is the great leveling effect here. That's what can bring us all into space and where maybe we could achieve some of the extraordinary goals that we might want to achieve, putting our own ideas into space or maybe discovering the way to save the Earth. It's possible that these little sprites, we call them, could land on the surface of an asteroid and, and sort of tag it, uh, indicate where it is and allow us to track it permanently. Maybe it could uh, tell us something important of scientific value, for example, the density or the kind of materials of which the satellite's made. In fact, maybe someday it could lead to understanding the character of these satellites so well that we know which ones to go to to mine them for uh, commercial purposes. So these chip satellites, these sprites, uh, they represent our effort to uh, try to democratize space. Um, it's particularly, I think, appropriate for students to realize that they're not that far away from being able to do something like this. You don't have to be an astronomer with 30 years of experience become a principal investigator on a Mars program to be able to go to space and do something extraordinary. Uh, space has opened up to all of us in a way that I think we wouldn't have understood even a decade or two ago. Uh, we funded this spacecraft, the 3U spacecraft, on a Kickstarter. Um, in fact, I, this is probably the, the eighth one of these you know, Kickstarter web captures you've seen uh, in the last uh, couple of days. Um, ours uh, was called KickSat after Kickstarter. Uh, we asked for $30,000 to build our CubeSat. We got $74,000, so we tripled it in size, and we were able to offer about 300 backers the opportunity to fly something of theirs in space. If you uh, gave us a particularly large amount of money, you could actually get your own uh, sprite and a programmer, and the sprite itself emulates Arduino, so you can actually use your Arduino knowledge to to make a spacecraft, make with a capital M. So the CubeSat launch initiative is a great opportunity that gives us access to space. Uh, it's run from the space station, uh, through the space station program. Uh, what you see here is this uh, kind of double-barreled shotgun thing that shoots the CubeSats out into space. And that picture in the middle is one of my favorites. It's the largest spacecraft ever designed by, uh, or ever implemented uh, by people with the smallest spacecraft right in front of it. So we have a one kilogram CubeSat, actually three of them up there, uh, behind a 400,000 kilogram uh, space station. I think I have a video here. Watch carefully. There they go. That's what it takes. So where can making take us? Uh, for our students, uh, they're interested in a number of different disciplines. Space uh, is one of those multidisciplinary fields. If you're interested in material science, structure, communications, electronics, uh, propulsion, fluid mechanics, orbit mechanics, it requires a multidisciplinary approach. It could be the case that someday when we're able to put a 3D printer in space, we can fabricate spacecraft not on the ground and launch them from the ground, but actually in orbit. Maybe the space station can serve as a base for building satellites and then we don't have to launch them. Uh, one of the things we're working on at, uh, at Cornell is a propulsion system that uses only water to propel a spacecraft. And even though it's not as good as, let's say, an ion thruster or one of the cryogenic rocket motors that NASA makes, it's good enough. In fact, it's good enough to help a CubeSat escape from Earth orbit entirely. What I'd like to do is send one of these things on its way to an asteroid, land on an asteroid, and then refuel. Because you could do that. With water as the propellant, all you have to do is find water on the asteroid. Maybe it's not that hard. Fill up your tank and keep going. Uh, water is one of those things you might think of as a rare a commodity in space. It's actually fairly common. There's water all over the moon. Uh, on Mars, it's quite common. In fact, a few meters down, there's a, essentially a water table on Mars. Um, go to the poles and it's right out in the open. Um, water is easy to find, it turns out. So since water is such an effective propellant, in fact, the space shuttle used to use hydrogen and oxygen, burn it to make water as the uh, propellant, um, since it's such a common and easy to use material, that could form the basis of a space economy someday. And I think making is at the heart of it. If we can make satellites in space, if we can fuel them in space, we can give access to space to everybody, not only the folks at NASA or the Air Force, but in fact all of us and all of our students. Thanks very much.